there is no alcohol user that is really in control of what they're doing. Uh, and you'll see this a lot for uh, for real in real life. When you stop drinking alcohol, you start to see this everywhere. You know that you start to see the the addiction in things in other people's drinking. You know how they are, um, how they're looking at their drink, how they're tasting it, how they're you know. And it's almost as if they're doing it on automatic pilot. How you doing, friend? Welcome along to this next video. Today, I'm going to talk about how being an alcoholic is ruining your life, uh, and it's not what you think. Um, this idea is, uh, let me start off with, with I, I did a video a couple of days ago, and I want to just start this video off with a couple of statements that I made in that. Um, one of the statements I made was that this fight is against ourselves. It's sort of um, a heartbreaking battle that is going on within yourself right it's heartbreaking for everyone around you it's heartbreaking for you most of all uh, and mostly for the waste of potential for all those possibilities that won't ever happen because you're so caught up in this mad power struggle that's going in, in your in your mind and the the worst part of the the power struggle is that there is no power in it that it is a pitiful thing that's going on it's a it's a really it's a dive into uh, it's a battle that's going nowhere that there is no winner in, right? You know, so long as the battle continues, this battle of moderation and keeping trying to to maintain this habit while keeping yourself in 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 going towards the person that you want to be is is a battle that you're never gonna you're never gonna win. Um, so let's talk about the word alcoholic for a minute. Um, I think it may be of some use to get people to to rethink their alcohol drinking behavior right to to really understand what they're doing to themselves before they stop drink uh, before they stop actually putting this stuff inside the body i think you know using that word on yourself and saying well maybe I, I might be an alcoholic um i think that's a good idea or you know it's possibly a good idea depending on how you see yourself but it's also a double-edged sword right and i believe that it's a word that keeps a lot of people drinking much longer than they otherwise would um, you know, it's my excuse. Uh, that's the way I used to think about it. I'm not an alcoholic. So, you know, even though I used to tell myself, well, yeah, my drinking might be bad. Uh, yeah, I might have behaved badly yesterday, or I might have said shit that I didn't want to say, say, or I might have drank too much, but I'm not an alcoholic. Because as I said, you know, there's always people that you can point at in your own life, uh, in your own surroundings that you can say, well, there's an alcoholic. And look, the, look at the difference. There's no, there's no comparison. So if he's an alcoholic, then how can I be what he is, right? So I also think that there's, there's some kind of a merit to it in, uh, or usefulness at least, within the medical profession. Um, you know, to be able to diagnose, uh, to be able to for, I mean, doctors are at, um, they're they're under pressure and they're under massive pressure to be able to deliver results very very quickly and usually that's through medication um, so I, I think when you go to a a non-specialist doctor a general doctor they're gonna they're only looking at you from that general perspective so they don't know anything else about any specifics they can't they, they, you know they're not specializing in alcoholism or any of these other things so if, you know, the, the, the best they can do is to point you in a direction and where are they going to point you uh, most doctors only know the AA and that's the only place that they're going to do. So I think from, you know, it's a, like I said, a double edged sword, because if the doctor's using the alcoholic and um, he understands it from that perspective, then that's his only line of, of sight. That's the only thing that he can see. So, you know, but I still think there, there is some use to it in, in order for them to say, well, yeah, this guy's got problems and or this guy needs medical attention because of a drink and, or, you know, this is the reason why they're in here is because of the alcohol that they're putting inside the body. So from that perspective, but from the personal use, from your use as a person who is trying to change, um, who, as a person who is trying to improve themselves and trying to live the best possible version of their lives. Um, especially after you've stopped drinking this stuff, I think the consequences of using the word alcoholic on yourself are bloody awful. I just, I think it's a, it's a disastrous thing to do with yourself. Um, now for me, I'm going to just talk about a couple of types of different drinkers or two types of alcohol users to give it a name, which 
um, is probably closer to actuality of what we're doing to ourselves and, and why we're using alcohol. It's a using perspective. I said this in that last video as well, um, that we, we call ourselves drinkers. We say what we're drinking is to drink and the act of it is actually drinking. So, you know, we can, you can do that with water. So it's very innocuous. It's an innocuous word and innocuous use of those words. Um, when we should really be saying to ourselves, well, no, we're actually using a drug, uh, using a dangerous drug. And that's the way we should approach it if you're trying to get rid of it in your life. Um, so there's the alcohol user who is, um, the way I would visualize it, um, the way I, I sort of seen it myself, he, they're turned outwards in their life, deflecting the alcoholic label away from themselves, right? You know, this was typically me, like I said, uh, it was the way my life was going. It was the way I looked at things throughout most of my life until maybe a few months before I started uh, on my own journey. This is the user who wants to remain uh, in control. This is the drinker who wants to remain in control of themselves, uh, who believes they're still in control. And think about, I don't know if you've ever seen Alan Carr's um, depiction, his analogy of the pitcher plant. Uh, have a look online and you'll see uh, the pitcher plant. And to know that this, the, the, there is no alcohol user that is really in control of what they're doing. Uh, and you'll see this a lot for uh, for real in real life. When you stop drinking alcohol, you start to see this everywhere. You know that you'll start to see the the addiction in things in other people's drinking. You know how they are, um, how they're looking at their drink, how they're tasting it, how they're you know. And it's almost as if they're doing it on automatic pilot, uh, among other things. So the uh, this outward facing user they want to remain the victor they want to remain the one in control of themselves they want to avoid being the victim at all costs and they're always convincing themselves that they're not the victim right and then there's the other type of alcohol drinker or the ex drinker um and this is the person who has turned that label inwards and that person who accepts and they embrace the term alcoholic for themselves and, and for me, they become the victim. You know, this is my belief. Uh, and I believe it's an inevitability for anybody who perceives themselves uh, in this way or hands their lives over, um, you know, starts to see their lives through that framework of alcoholic. They give in to this invisible. They, they have conceded defeat, uh, defeat to the, um, the invisible disease, the bad gene, um, all of these things that are run underneath the surface, that they're unseen. Uh, this is kind of impelled behavior. Like I was saying with the, the person that you'll see, the addicted person, it's, it's something that is unconscious that they're not thinking about, right? Uh, this is something that is devouring them, this sickness and uh, the overwhelming urges. This is all comes with that word alcoholic, you know, and, and these people have given up control to a certain degree to, to that part of their lives. And because they've given up uh, to that part of their lives, they've also given up um, to other areas of lives, which I'll talk about now. Think about this from a reality perspective, right? What is it that, what is it exactly that changes when a person begins to label themselves an alcoholic, right? From the moment before, they name themselves an alcoholic to the moment after. What is it that changes or not changes? Right? And I think that very little, this, you know, objectively, nothing has changed, right? The habit is exactly the same. The behavior is exactly the same. You still drink the same type of alcohol. You still drink the same brand. You still drink in the same place. You still drink the same amounts, probably with the same people. So nothing in reality, objectively speaking, has changed, Right. The real changes, and, and again, I'm talking from one moment to the next. So from the moment that the person says to themselves, I am an alcoholic, right? The real changes happen on the inside, in the subjective world, in your thoughts, right? Your thinking suddenly shifts from a person who is in control to a person who can't help being the way that they are. You know, this new persona, um, this new person that you've become because you've given yourself that label of the alcoholic can't help being an alcoholic user because it's in the genes, right? How can you help what happens in your genes? You know, it explains everything that's gone on before, right? 
um, that this is a flaw in your genes that forces you to be the way that you are. It's not something that you want particularly to, to happen. You don't need it, certainly, to happen in your life. But it's something that you, that you have to understand that, that this, this is it. This is who you are, right? End of story. That is something that you can't change. And the same goes with the so-called alcohol, uh, alcoholism disease. When you start to say to yourself, I've got this disease, um, you can't help this disease. You have a disease and it's emanating from God knows where uh, on the inside of you on the inside of your body or the inside of your mind, or maybe uh, even the inside of your soul, right? And the worst thing is there's no cure for any of this. No cure for the gene, no cure for the disease. You're stuck with it. And not only are you stuck with that physical um, weakness, that physical deformity, you're stuck with the shameful label for the rest of your life of alcoholic. So what does that make you and for me it creates a victim a victim mentality a victim by name victim by nature um you know when you can't change something because it's a faulty gene or a deeply embedded and incurable disease what can you do about it a big fat zero all you can do is go to meetings for the rest of your life in some attempt at controlling this invisible weakness right you know, it's not the actual state that has shifted at all, like I said, but the invisible um, power of this word, right? Of this, of, of all the meanings that are attached to this word, everything that it stands for. You know, if you stand in front of the mirror and you call yourself ugly enough times, then guess what you're going to start to think of yourself, right? And it doesn't matter what anyone else tells you, that's going to be the way it is. You know, a young girl or a young boy, they're telling themselves over and over that they're fat when, in fact, they're as skinny as a rake, right? Or on the opposite end of the scale, a muscle-bound he-man, right? He's got lots of muscles. He goes to the gym every day and he's pumping up. But he's looking at himself in the mirror all the time and he's telling himself, you're not strong enough. Um, my muscles are not big enough, mate. You know what I mean? What you're doing, you need to get your muscles bigger, there you've got two cases of uh, what body dysmorphia, but two cases of people who are telling themselves something which is not true. You know, they're telling themselves this story over and over again. And if you tell yourself things like this, if you tell yourself you're stupid <laughs> enough times, that power of the, the word is going to create the reality, your reality, right? So this perceived out of controlledness of the alcoholic, um, the sense of weakness and uh, infirmity. You know, that reason to think that we're just not good enough or we're not quite right in the head uh, or we've got a, a blemished sense of ourselves. This is easy to spill over into other areas of, of your life because you think you're genetically hampered in one area of your life. You know, it's bound to have knock-on effects that you think, well, you know, maybe I'm not good enough in this area as well, or maybe this effect is affecting me in this area. And the, the thing is that there's probably a modicum of truth in it, right? Or so you think, right? So you see the evidence to back up your story. So you're telling yourself this story, and then because you're telling yourself often enough, you start to see evidence of that in your real life. So the alcohol drinking, you know, in reality, alcohol drinking affects so many other areas of your life, right? So... Uh, alcohol in your body it's swimming around in your uh, all over your in through your bloodstream it's going around in your cranium and there's a general handicap and influence right there's a general influence of dumbing things down of damage the more you drink the more your peripheral life everything else in your life is going to be affected by that um you know i did a video recently where i was talking about the disastrous effects of alcohol on the brain uh, that was one of the scariest things for me but there are also areas in your life, such as your self-belief, your self-confidence, your perception of who you are as a person, which is now affected not only because you're poison, uh, poisoning yourself, you're pouring this poison in, in, into your body, into your gob, but also because you're accepting somebody else's quack explanation of your behavior. 
defining yourself with their label, alcoholic, right? And everything that that means, right? The drinking person, you know, the, the individual person is complicated, but the drinking person, think about, we'll narrow it down to the drinking person. I mean, why, why did you start drinking alcohol? Why are you drinking alcohol now? When I think about why did I start drinking alcohol all those years ago? Um, why did I drink alcohol 30 years ago? Why did I drink alcohol 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago? Right? To each of those, I can give a different answer. Uh, I can give a different answer now, looking backwards, and I can give a completely different answer back then, you know, just in the moment. Um, and maybe, yeah, like I said, different answers. But think about it like this. To try and reduce one person's behavior down to, um, let's say if you were trying to write a book, on somebody and you're trying to reduce their behavior or their who they are the essence of them um their their life their their being as a person how they uh how they how they think how they behave all those kind of things if you were to try and do that in a book it would be a multi-volume book you know have you ever seen a um uh, a movie for instance where they try and capture somebody's life story and all they can really do is capture the very basic bare essence of that story and it's usually leaving out everything that is humdrum leaving everything out that is boring and normal and just focusing very often they just focus on a, a very very short period of time in their lives you know the the one thing that you know when einstein discovered the general theory of relativity or when crick discovered the dna or whatever you know that kind of thing or when the wright brothers first took off you know small events leading up to that and a little bit afterwards, but, you know, very short space of time, very essential stuff. When, when you try to reduce someone's behavior, um, why they're doing everything that they're doing down into a single word, you know, if you try and say to somebody, well, th that's what they are. This person is an alcoholic. Good luck with that. You know, um, you know, the word itself then has no meaning when you describe everybody in the same sense. One of my biggest gripes about school is they treat everybody the same. You know, they try and teach the same subjects to every student that comes in the door. And that's just not the way that we operate. And it's no wonder that only a few people shine, you know. But as I said, when you try and reduce everything down to one word, the word itself gets no meaning. It, the, the meaning disappears. You know, it cannot be the same thing to all people. You know, your drinking habit is completely different to my what mine was. Um, I'm completely different to the next person, the next person, because... All of these things, if you look at alcohol from the perspective of alcohol is a tool and alcohol is a tool to do whatever this in your life. Um, and the complexity of a person's behavior and how they can change the behavior, you know, only that those individual people can really see uh, how much their behavior can be improved and how they can improve their behaviors. Um, yeah, I think sometimes you can look in from the outside and you can see things that that the individual can't see because they're so engrossed in their own lives and stuff. And you might be able to say to them, well, you know, this is um, this is the point. This is where you can go. It's a good thing about coaching, I suppose. But as to the individual changes that they make, any therapist will tell you, any therapist worth their salt will tell you that the individual has to make the changes themselves, that all you can be is a guide. So getting back to the word alcoholic, it's a null word. Um, but the problem the real problem I think lies in because the world, the, the, the word alcoholic has no meaning. It takes on every possible meaning that you can stuff in there. Right. You get all this, you get the word with all its nasty baggage. You get everything that applies to you and everything that doesn't apply to you all in that one word. You get what I was talking about earlier on. You get the, the drunk that you see who is at the end of his tether at the bottom, you know, the rock bottom of his life living in the doorway you get that is the alcoholic plus whatever you have got, right? Everything gets lumped in together. So yes, uh, you get the drinking, um, you get lots of drinking. That's a commonality, it seems, you know, of, of the drinking, but everything else, um, how much, how often, how long, you know, these things are sort of arbitrarily assigned by the person making the judgment. Uh, and you also get the unreliability, the degrading nature of the possible criminality of the alcoholic the shame um the insanity which is a term used by aa you know those 12 steps are there designed for everyone 
you know, when they say they're going to bring you back to sanity, it implies that you are insane in the first place. So that is a term that is loaded into alcoholic. You're reduced to, as a person, not only to what you have done as a drinker, what you have personally done as a drinker, but for what everybody else has done as a drinker, everyone else who has that label, right? As I said, alcohol is a tool. It's used for a multitude of different purposes and behaviors. There's only a few that should it should be used for, but us as alcohol users, we use it, uh, we imbibe it, we put it into our mouths and we swallow it time and time again for a whole load of different reasons, right? And a whole load of different behavioral reactions. So think about the label computer programmer, right? That, you know, this is um, something that you can apply to somebody, but think about how many different programs um, a programmer can make, you know, a program is basically a tool that can be, have a, a billion different purposes from that perspective. So alcohol is the same thing. If you focus on the alcohol, you are nowhere near, nor will you ever get anywhere near the truth of the problem. It's only when you take the alcohol out of the equation and then, and only then do you start to, or can you really start to figure out what's really going on in your life and how to solve the things? Because as soon when you've got this thing pounding on your brain all the time, dumbing you down, how can you think straight? And when you can't think straight, how can you solve your problems? So it's only when you take the alcohol out, then you can start to think about these things. The worst thing for me uh, in, in all of this is the reductionist thinking. That is, anyone can attempt to reduce a person's life to a word, right? Um, and that's what happens if you focus someone else's attention onto you stopping drinking alcohol, that's where their focus is going to remain. That's what they will think. They will feel. I can't tell you the amount of people that have said they feel sorry for me because I had to stop drinking alcohol. <laughs> if only they knew, you know. You know, there are plenty of examples of people who um, are, are defined and are continuously defined by that word. You know, the alcoholic down the road, or he's an alcoholic, or she's an alcoholic because that's the way they've, they have been focused in other people's minds. But it's more important for you to think of how that word focuses your mind. You know, some people become addicted to the meetings instead of the alcohol. And some people will say, well, that's a good thing, you know, better to be addicted to going to meetings than to drinking alcohol. And yeah, I have to agree, but there's more than two choices, right? There's more than either going to the meetings or go back to the alcohol. You know, why does the alcohol have to play a part in your life in any way, shape, or form? It doesn't. So it's only you that allows this to happen. So I think if you want to be defined by your past, then you carry on using that word alcoholic with yourself. Um, but if you, you know, in any other shape of life, you would say to yourself, well, this is, this is something that I used to be, and I'm going to move on now. So, you know, think about it like a, an ex-girlfriend, if you define yourself by the ex-girlfriend or the ex-wife or the ex-husband or whatever it is, and you continue to drag that with you throughout your life, how does that bode for any more romantic relationships? How does it bode for any deep relationships if you're thinking about the past partner? It doesn't. And it's the same thing here. You know, if you want to get on with your life, stop linking yourself with your old a habit that you used to have. I feel sorry for people who 20 years later are still calling themselves alcoholics, are still defining themselves by something that they did in the past. So don't do that. If you want help with stopping drinking alcohol, we've got a um, Habits Feed 2. We've also got the uh, Quick Start Preparation Guide, the short guide, it's free. Click on the link down below. It'll help you to just get some insight into um, a lot of these things, a lot of these things that will hold you back if you don't understand them from a, a perspective. And it's all I'm doing is to try and show you a different perspective, just to try and give you a different way of looking at these things um, that might be helpful to you. So uh, hopefully this video was helpful to you and I wasn't going on too long. Take care of yourself and uh, I'll speak to you again in the next video. Onwards and upwards. Bye, friend.